Okay, our final lecture today is Dr. Roger Garrison, who is a professor of economics at Auburn University. He's the author of Time and Money, the Macroeconomics of the Capital Structure. He was, in 2003, he was named the first visiting Hayek Fellow at the London School of Economics. And Dr. Garrison is gonna be speaking to us on Austrian capital theory. Roger? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, if my count's right, you've sat through five lectures already today. Is that correct? And you're ready for a sixth one? This doesn't quite mesh with the Auburn culture, but uh, I'm glad to see the enthusiasm. Uh, Austrian capital theory, and I have subtitles here, two views. Uh, the Knightian stock flow view, that would be Frank Knight, and the Hayekian stages of production. Uh, view or model. And uh, my goal here uh, this afternoon is to use the Hayekian view as something of a setup for tomorrow's uh, lecture on the Austrian theory of the business cycle. Uh, and the Knightian view will serve as a setup for a later lecture when I talk about the differences between Hayek and Friedman and explain why Friedman had no use for uh, the Austrian theory of the business cycle because he was a Knightian. He had a stock flow view of capital and uh, not a Hayekian stages of production. I would have liked to include a third view, which we could have called the Keynesian view, but uh, Hayek's criticism of Keynes was precisely that he didn't have a capital theory, that uh, he, he had macroeconomic theory without an underlying capital theory base, which is what accounts for uh, the huge difference between Hayek and Keynes. So if you're going to call it anything, it have to be the animal spirits model. That's what Keynes thought drove investment decisions. Uh, okay, I want to start just uh, by recognizing that the word capital gets used in several different meanings. And I just want to sort out a few here and zero in on the ones that I'll be talking about today, the many meanings of capital. Uh, you hear a lot these days about bank capital. Uh, there isn't any, or there's very little. Uh, and when they say bank capital, they simply mean assets minus liability, and that is net worth. Uh, they are saddled with capital requirements, and banks are worried these days about not meeting their capital requirements, which is why they're hesitant to lend money. That's bank capital. Let's see if we can find another one. Uh, financial capital, I went too far. Financial capital, that's just uh, the, the cash uh, and other funds raised by stock and bond sales so a firm's financial capital is simply the funds it has to um, invest, to operate, uh, based on how much is borrowed, how much stock it's sold. Uh, that's financial capital, okay? Uh, capital goods, a distinction that uh, between capital, as you've seen them, these first two things, and capital goods, distinction made by Bon Bavaric and picked up on by Mises, that the goods themselves uh, refer to the physical goods, the plant and equipment, and stocks of raw materials, and some finished materials. Okay, those are, are capital goods. Uh, then goods in process. Uh, these are these are things that are in the mill. Uh, sheet steel. Uh, it's it's been processed. It's no longer iron ore, but neither is it a fender for an automobile or a part of a finished automobile. It's goods in process, that's uh, working capital. And a lot of the Austrian theory, especially the business cycle theory, makes do with that concept of capital just because it's cleaner and simpler, uh, simpler and, and it, uh, it avoids dealing with some uh, very complex problems about uh, capital in other forms. Uh, capitalized value. Uh, no, let's see. I, you know, I, I keep s skipping them. Capitalized value. That's simply the present value of some future income 
stream. That gets uh, used as or, or one of the definitions of capital. Human capital uh, would be the present value of skilled workers' earnings uh, in the future. And now I'm getting, when I write capital stock here, I underline stock, and I want to pay particular attention to this because this is the nub of what we're going to talk about today. The capital stock is simply the stock of productive factors that yields a flow uh, of consumption goods. And so I've underlined stock and flow. And this view of capital is a very holistic view. It applies to the economy as a whole uh, in the sense that we have a capital stock which yields a flow of consumption goods. So we have a stock of it and a flow from it. And that's the basic vision that Frank Knight used uh, in talking about the issues of capital. And the contrast then is with capital structure. Uh, that's the Austrian view. And by structure, we mean a temporal pattern uh, of heterogeneous capital goods. Uh, and here, the, the focus is more on how these things fit together uh, to produce consumer goods and what the time profile is of the structure of production and when those goods can be delivered. Is it in short order? Does it take a while? Those are uh, some of the issues. Um, I want to turn now briefly uh, to the measurement of capital. And uh, you hear the Austrians talking about this quite a bit, although very little of the theory actually depends on a hardcore measurement of particular pieces of capital goods or certainly of the whole uh, collection of capital goods uh, as a whole, and, and partly because uh, capital is so heterogeneous. And so uh, we write capital is uh, heterogeneous. And you could say, yeah, yeah, it is, but so is labor, uh, so is land. Factors are all heterogeneous. Well, if we had Ludwig Lachmann here, uh, he would introduce uh, an adverb there. Capital is radically homogeneous. And again, you can say, okay, okay fine, uh, how radical is it? All right? Well, the way I like to put it is that capital is dimensionally heterogeneous, which sort of forestalls any effort to try to add up the different pieces of capital. Let me explain what I mean when I say dimensionally heterogeneous. I can write three sentences here and uh, allow you to fill in the blank. This might be on your final exam, I don't know, okay. Uh, not all units of labor are alike. Well, yeah, it's, they're heterogeneous. <coughs> not all units of land are alike, yeah? Same thing, heterogeneous. And not all units of capital are alike. But the challenge is to fill in the blank and tell me what do you mean by units? Well, the first two are easy. Not all units, that would be worker hours. Not all worker hours of capital are alike. That's correct, but they're all worker hours, okay? Uh, not all, what would you put in land? Acres could be square feet, okay? Not all acres are alike. Well, that's true, uh, but they're all acres, right? And what do you put for capital. This is what I mean by dimensionally heterogeneous. In fact, I became sensitized when I was a graduate student to the different words that the neoclassical economists use for units of capital. And one of the more common ones was, can you guess it? Units. You say a marginal unit of capital, okay? And that's, uh, I always circle that, you know, well, what is this unit? Uh, a unit is not a unit, I, you know, it's, a, it's not a specific unit. But there are others that I became sensitive to. One was doses, <laughs> you buy into that. Uh, another one, chunks, a chunk of capital. And another one, hunks, okay? <laughs> Take your choice. But it just emphasizes uh, that capital has no units that are serviceable all around. I actually Googled to find out what these, what, is, what do these things look like? And I Googled to find out there's a dose, okay? And a chunk, and a hunk. <laughs> yeah. 
I think that's a reference to human capital, okay? <laughs> okay, there's a couple of more hunks. Uh, that's Knight and Hayek. They had it out back in the 1930s about the nature of capital, and, and it was over this business of a stock flow or a structure of capital. And Knight argued that the time element in the production process was simply irrelevant. There are economists today that argue that same thing, and we'll see some of the more recent ones that have argued that. But the time element is irrelevant according to Knight, and we'll see why he thinks that. Uh, Hayek wrote a famous article, at least famous in our Austrian circles, uh, called The Mythology of Capital, and it was 1936, and he was just literally making sport of uh, Frank Knight's view. So Hayek uh, and Knight in, in the 1930s. By the way, I, I like Knight very much on other counts, his treatment of uh, risk, uncertainty of profit, <coughs> and profit, a great book, and so on, and uh, his defense of liberty, his critique of Keynes. It's all great stuff. It's just when he turns to capital uh, that he's just missed it by a long shot. And then I might recognize that that same debate was held uh, about 35 years earlier, about the turn of the century, by two other economists, and that would be John Bates Clark and Bon Beverk. And of course, Bon Beverk, who talked about uh, a capital structure in his own terms, uh, under, underlies the Austrian theory uh, of the business cycle. We'll see more about that. Uh, Clark adopted a view that's uh, the same as Knight. In fact, Knight picked it up uh, from Clark. And I have to say that I also have a very special place in my heart for John Bates Clark, but only because he looks exactly like my grandfather. You know, this is important to me. Okay. Now, a term I like to use here is black box capital theory. Does black box remind you of anything where you hear, see, hear it about a black box? Anybody know? Yeah, the flight recorder. The flight recorder. There it is. Flight recorder on an aircraft. Is it black? What color is it? Orange. Okay. Uh, now, why do they call it a black box? Actually, it's a technical term that comes from uh, the field of electronics. Uh, I've written it out here that uh, any complex piece of equipment, typically a plug-and-play unit in an electronic system with contents about which the user has no need to know. That's, uh, in electronics, you call that a black box. You, 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 get, you do for your client what he wants. He says, I've got these inputs and I want those outputs. Put something in this box that will do it. And you put it in there and you sell it to him. And you say, you notice it says, do not open. <laughs> do not open. Well, they don't need to open because they don't, know what, don't need to know what's in it. They just plug it in and play it, all right? And it has input, it has output, and that's all they need to know. That's it. Well, that's Knight's capital theory. In fact, I looked, Googled, and I found the capital stock. There's input, output, and uh, a black box, okay, appropriately colored. Uh, only thing mixing, missing is do not enter, okay, or do not open. So the, uh, the Knightians or the Clarkians don't, don't bother about just what's inside uh, the box. All right. Now, I want to illustrate first a steady state economy, which is largely the focus of Clark and Knight. And a steady state economy has a given capital stock, there it is in the box, and it has a flow, all right? But capital tends to wear out uh, as it proceeds, and so you need some maintenance. You need to, need to put some back into the capital stock just to keep it from falling. Maintenance, okay? So let's see if we can get a flow going here. It doesn't want to work just right, but you get the idea that uh, 
No, it works on the screen here. It just doesn't work on mine. No. There you go. So you've got the flow of consumption goods and you've got the maintenance of capital, which is a feedback loop, going back into the, going back into the stock. And that can just go on forever. Okay? That's the story. Now... Okay, let's just look at the capital stock and actually I need that maintenance there because there's a certain critical point to be made uh, and that is that the capital stock in this theory includes the maintenance as a technical detail. Just as a matter of technical detail, this capital has to be maintained. If if it weren't maintained, it would eventually wear out and you wouldn't have any capital. Right? has to be maintained. And so uh, maintenance ends up being a, a technical uh, detail. Now, Knight has something to say about that. He says, hence, the capital stock is permanent. And permanent is Knight's word. And also the quotation marks are Knight's. In other words, you look through Knight's work, uh, he puts quotation marks on a lot of words that sort of tip you off to mean, does he really mean that, you know? That capital is permanent? Uh, and he qualifies it sometimes, let's see. Capital stock is permanent, he says, in a sense. Well, what's the sense? The sense is if you maintain it, it's permanent, okay? Uh, other places, he has a little different way of putting it. Capital is permanent, as it were, okay? <laughs> I became sensitized to this in graduate school, too. Capital is permanent, so to speak, okay? Well, <laughs> the, sum, the sum of that is capital is not permanent. You know, you've got to do something uh, to, to keep it from wearing out, okay? Now, that has implications, and you can guess what they are downstairs. I hope you can see it accordingly. The permanent capital stock yields a perpetual in income and per with perpetual in quotes, okay? Does it qualify that? Well, yeah. In a sense, as it were, so to speak, okay? So that's the, the Knightian capital uh, theory. Now, Okay, so we have that the economy is a system of capital yielding uh, consumable output, all right? Uh, he even gets more severe than that in his terminology, and I present this because it'll come back to us when we look at Friedman and his treatment of the Austrians. Uh, instead of calling, the, using the word capital, he uses the word source. And instead of consumption, he says services. So in this consumption, and let's change it in our diagram, that's probably what we do here. Yeah, so we, we've got sources that are maintained automatically as a technological detail, and we've got services which are produced by the sources. So instead of a stock flow, you have source service. And the essence of this is that anything, any actual thing, like the chunk or any something you could hold in your hand, any thing that you think might be a consumer good, think of one now, according to Knight, really isn't. It's a capital good yielding a service, okay? So if it's a radio, is that a consumer good? No, it's a capital good, and it yields a service, which it plays music and so on, okay? So uh, there's no more any capital goods. It's just, it's just flows of services, all right? And from this, he, he concludes, Knight does, that really there's only one factor of production. Can you guess what it is? It's capital. Yeah, that's right. So it's capital in the broad sense uh, of the term, or in the broad sense of sources. So it turns out land, labor, and capital are all capital in the broadest sense, because you just have sources yielding services. I put an asterisk on labor, because it's hard to think of labor as a stock, as as capital, but you can think of the workforce 
or you could think of human capital. Okay, you got human capital that'll yield the services uh, provided by the labor and so on. So uh, we have that going for us in uh, the Nidian view. Okay, let me back that up. What I'm showing here is uh, an expanding economy. In other words, even Knight recognizes that economies grow and sometimes you plow back more uh, than is needed just for maintenance. And if you do, then, then the capital stock increases. And so that's what this shows you. So you've got a bigger flow back into the capital stock. And so you get a big capital stock. So you can have an expanding economy like that. Can you have a contracting economy? Well, yeah, if you, if you under-maintain, so if what you're plowing back is less, and you have a big flow out and a little trickle going in, uh, then you get something like this. Okay, so it could, it could go to pot for you, too. That, that gets recognized. Now, from all of that, Knight concludes that we don't have to worry about production time. That's taken care of within inside that box. Okay. And people after Knight defended that, especially the people from the Chicago School. The one I'll focus on here is Stigler, because Stigler was a cohort of Freedmen. They were very close. Uh, and Stigler wrote his dissertation on capital theory. It was called Production and Distribution Theories. That was the title of his dissertation, 1941. And so we'll see what he had to say. In a minute, I'll show you what he was talking about. What about the production time in the Clark Knight vision? Well, following Clark, uh, he posited uh, a forest from, from which we can harvest wood, okay? I'm just showing one row of the trees. Actually, there are lots of rows behind that. You just can't see them for the first row, okay? About 50 rows behind that. <coughs> you can look at one of them. And here's the story, that once a steady state is reached, and that, now see, that's the qualification. And instead of saying something about maintenance is a technological detail, he said, well, okay, once the steady state is reached, I suppose that's a technological detail, uh, then production time is irrelevant. How so? Well, the trees have a linear maturity structure. It's actually log linear, but we'll get him, let him get away with linear. Uh, and each period of sapling can be set out, and at the same time, a tree is harvested, right? You have a whole row that you set out in a whole row that you harvest. And let's see if we can do that. Here's year one. So you set out a new sapling there on the west side of it. Did you see that? Yeah, there's a new sapling. And you harvest the big one. All right? That's period one. And then the next period, you have the same maturity profile because these things grow. There they are, okay? And you can do it again. So each year you can set out a tree to the west there and harvest one on the east, and it stays the same forever, except the whole forest keeps moving west, I guess, but we won't worry about that. Somebody, location theory is where you need, what you need there. So now here's again a knight with his quotation marks. So he says, this, it is the setting out that, quote, enables the harvesting. And if you didn't quite get that, look at his next one. Setting out the sapling now produces the harvestable, harvestable tree now. So there's no production time. Production and consumption are simultaneous, again, in quotes. Uh, and it's not that I'm, I am quoting Knight. I, I probably should have put it in double quotes because he had the quotes in. Uh, so they're simultaneous. So, so much for Hayek in all of that blather about production time. That's night. 
All right? Qualifications there are there, they are again. In a sense, as it were, so to speak, it works that way. Uh, now, this sounds a little bit insane, and yet that's the Chicago view of capital theory. That's the reason that Chicago didn't want to hire Hayek when he tried to get a job there in the economics department, because they didn't like his capital theory, because they were all Knightians, okay? Uh, now, for, for the Friedmanites, for, the, for Chicago, not really as bad as it sounds, because it's, it's not really, it's not really that Friedman worked this theory into his own theories about money and prices. So he didn't really do that. You can't imagine him doing that because this, this just doesn't ring true at all. But what he did do is take it on the authority of nine that he didn't have to worry about production time and he didn't have to deal with Hayek, all right? Because production and consumption are uh, simultaneous. More about that when we get to Friedman. And here I'll, I'll show you uh, something that's directly from George Stigler's 1941 book when he deals with this issue. This is Ch Chicago Economics, Stigler, 1941. He defends Clark against Mon Okay, uh, And here's what he says. He says, we can say that any one row of trees takes 50 years to, ma to mature, but since there is a constant output of timber forever, there's simply no point in saying it. Okay? Now, that's just night in through and through. All right? And he might as well added a, a sentence that says, so much for Hayek. Now, a little summary slide here <clears throat> where you can see what's going on. I'm con contrasting Knight and Hayek, and Knight says maintenance is a technological detail. No, according to the Austrians, Hayek, maintenance is a matter of choice. You can choose to maintain it, choose to under-maintain it, choose to make capital grow. Capital is permanent. No, it's ever-changing. Capital is the only factor. No, but capital is a unique and heterogeneous factor. It has to be dealt with a little differently than other factors. Uh, production time is irrelevant. No, production time is the key variable. One of the key features of the Austrian theory is that it, it puts production time in as an endogenous variable from the get-go, okay? and. That's something that many macro theories don't do at all. Certainly, uh, capital theory coming out of the Chicago School, because time's irrelevant. And even in neoclassical economics or Keynesian uh, economics, uh, if anything, time is added as almost an afterthought as lag, lag structure. Maybe this lags that or leads that, okay? But with the Austrians, they put the time element into the theory from the get-go. It's a key factor. So summarizing even further here, it's all about sources and services. No, it's all about the temporal capital structure and whether it accords with people's uh, saving preferences. Uh, it's about steady-state equilibrium. In other words, all of the hardcore propositions that Knight and Clark made were propositions that were only true when you had a steady state. In other words, when maintenance just kept the capital stock from falling or rising, uh, for that matter. And according to the Hayek, no, it's, uh, it's about dynamic market processes. How does the market uh, uh, respond to a change in saving, for instance? How does it respond to an expansion of credit? Uh, so those are the dynamic aspects. Okay, now I want to shift to Hayek and show what a world of difference we have here. And I'll come back at the end and we'll compare them once more. Uh, Menger's Law. Uh, it was Israel Kirshner that started using that phrase, Menger's Law. Uh, and it, it was expressed in terms of orders of goods. 
and the orders were related to one another temporally. Uh, and his ordering looks something like this. Uh, let me get the orders up there and then we'll discuss. I've ordered them from bottom to top, first order goods, second order goods. And the reason I do that <clears throat> is only because the early goods, which here are seventh order goods, earliest, uh, the earlier goods were called higher ordered goods, higher, higher ordered goods by Menger. Okay, so we'll put them higher. I don't want them down there at the bottom and then call them higher order goods. Up at the top, higher order goods. Uh, and those goods of the first order, then those are, guess what? Consumer goods, okay? Consumption goods. Uh, now, Menger's law is stated up there, the value of the higher order goods derives from the value of the respective consumer goods. Uh, this was, this was uh, bedrock, it was ground zero of the subjectivist revolution. Uh, and for the most part, not completely, but for the most part, economics that had gone on before that adopted some sort of a labor theory of value or cost of production theory of value, some Cost is what determines production. And Minger was there to say, no, no, that's not the theory of value. The theory of value starts with the valuation of the final product, the consumer goods. And, and that value gets imputed then backwards to the factors of production. Uh, and so to show how radical it was, we'll put two arrows here. No, there's the intermediate goods, higher order goods. So what Minger is saying is that, of course, production itself proceeds from top to bottom. In other words, you have to start by digging iron ore out of the ground and then work on it a while. You might get some sheet steel and keep working. Eventually, you get a car fender or something, and eventually a consumer good, right? So production has to start in the higher orders. But the value goes the other way, okay? The value goes from bottom to top, which changes the whole way you look at economics. One way it changes it is, is that you recognize the crucial, crucial need for entrepreneurs. I mean, entrepreneurs are people that are back there at that seventh order looking forward, thinking, now, what was, would sell? You know, what, what would... How would people value a consumer good that we could produce by doing this, that, and the other uh, over a period of time? So you need some very forward-looking entrepreneurs. Usually they're just looking one stage ahead. That's, that's what the stages of production are all about. But you need some entrepreneurs to keep the economy glued together. Uh, okay, where do we go from here? There's an alternative uh, by Bon Bavere. You know, when you look at the orders of goods, you might say, okay, that's very logical. It didn't take much to think that up. It didn't really stick uh, initially. One of Menger's followers was uh, Bon Bavere. And yet he had his own way of looking at it. Uh, concentric rings. I don't know why he did this. But uh, essentially the different rings mean different orders of good, and it starts in the middle. He says it starts in the middle and emanates outward. Uh, and what he's doing here is just contrasting uh, a poor country with a rich country and recognizing that only a rich company or country, uh, the people can afford to wait, you know, can afford to have resources tied up for a longer period of time to go through a number of stages to get. Uh, the output that they want. The poor countries hand to mouth and so on, so you don't have uh, as many stages of production. So uh, let me just take a survey here. I know you're all Austrian enthusiasts, you read Austrian literature and so on, you listen to all. I want, I want to ask, how many have seen this diagram before? Be proud. My God, one, two, three, four, five. I'm amazed that that many have. Congratulations, you've seen it, okay? But the point is that Nobody has, okay? <laughs> except five people in this room. How many people outside this room have seen it? 
Uh, in other words, it was, I call it a pedagogical non-starter. <laughs> Nobody went with Bomba Bear, we're sorry. Uh, so we go back to orders of goods. But Hayek went this direction, except he just used a different language. He, he, he talked about stages of production uh, and not orders of goods. But if you've read Prices in Production, or if you've looked at it, how many have done that? Look at Prices in Production. Okay, more. Not too many more. Okay, but some more. Uh, you'll see uh, his diagram. It looks like that. Uh, and I'll clean it up. Let me get rid of Minger here. Instead of orders of goods, uh, it's stages of production. But it's the same thing, all right? And, and it makes the same point, that, that you start uh, producing in the higher orders and eventually get the, uh, the consumer good. Okay, I'm going to clean it up a little bit just to simplify it, all right? And so now, if you look at the, the horizontal dimension, output of consumer goods, we're measuring that final output horizontally along that vertical axis. That's what Hayek did. And it means that the vertical axis shows production time, and the time is coming down along the vertical axis. Well, all right, but that sounds kind of odd. And if you're trying to persuade people who don't know anything about the Austrians, they get hung up on that. Time is coming down the Austrian or the vertical axis. What does time do when it hits the origin? <laughs> well, you've got the consumer goods there. So it occurred to me that there ought to be some way to fix that problem because you normally think of time going along the horizontal axis. There's got to be some way to do that, and there it is, okay, <laughs> there it is. I show that because Walter Block, he's not here today, is he, or not in the room? Walter Block, in one of his articles, credited me, credited me for having turned the, high, the triangle sideways, you know. I think, I think I should take a bow, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> but I turned it sideways, and then uh, beyond that, I did actually what Hayek did too, is I cleaned it up uh, because we do call it a Hayekian triangle, which is just a, a, almost an iconic representation of these stages of production. And, and the stages themselves are a little bit iconic, you know, because it's not intended to claim that there are seven stages and only seven stages. No, 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 there are lots of stages. It's just for pedagogical reasons, we divide it into stages to emphasize the temporal nature of the production process. And the output of one stage feeds in as input in the successive stage, and over a number of stages, which entails a lot of time, uh, eventually consumer goods emerge uh, that, the, that the consumer buys, okay? So we do it that way, right? And I'll clean it up a little bit. Hayek in triangle. So production time is measured as simply a sequence uh, of stages. And yeah, that's simple, but that's a virtue. You know, we want to keep it as simple as we can and still keep uh, the concepts there. And in fact, if, if, you're, if you have an aversion to simplicity, then I recommend Hayek's uh, 1941 Pure Theory of Capital. Uh, and you can use those diagrams. I think I've got one here. There it is. <laughs> so that's his modification, and it's the worst of, worst of both worlds. In other words, it's not complex enough actually to capture all that's going on in the markets for capital goods, but it's much too complex to do anything with, okay? And uh, that, that diagram has been treated about like Bomberberg's circular rings, <laughs> okay? It doesn't show up except for entertainment purposes like that, okay? Yeah, pure theory of capital, there it is. All right, now what I'm gonna do is show you how we use that triangle to illustrate much more than the nighty and black box theory could possibly illustrate, and yet illustrate it in a way that's a, that's a perfectly consistent with the way you think of the economy 
working. And it goes like this. Uh, we have temporally defined in stages of production. And it, there they are. So I'm still using the triangle, but for now at least I've divided it into five stages. Uh, we can conceive of that early stage uh, as something that's very future-oriented. And here I say uh, product development. Right? The guy looks like he knows what he's doing, but it's going to be a long time before he's got something to sell to the consumer. In fact, when he's through with it, it still has to go through a number of stages of production in order uh, to be sold to the consumer. If you look at the right side of the triangle, you see inventory management. That's capital, even in the Austrian view or the neoclassical views, uh, stocks of consumer goods at retail. In other words, they're not in the hands of consumers. So a late stage would be investment uh, in uh, inventory and inventory management. Uh, so it won't be long, this guy hopes. Actually, he doesn't have any customers. That's the only thing he's missing. But won't be long until he's got customers in there buying the consumption goods. So uh, I like to think of the stages of production uh, in that way and, and not in trying to quantify uh, exactly how long it will be or exactly how early stage or late stage uh, something is. Okay. So this is really just for pedagogical convenience that I've divided into five. See, I've simplified it more. I've got, instead of seven stages, I've got five, although eventually we'll get six out of it. Okay. So uh, we're showing the structure that way, having five stages. With growth, the number can increase, as we'll see. All right. Uh, and Hayek makes the point that the, that the triangle and including the one on the screen, has two complementary definitions. One is that it shows a process through time. You start at the early stage. I like to say I call it early stage now because I don't have it at the top. The higher order <laughs> is early stage. You start at the early <laughs> stage and move through to the late stages. And it shows processes that are all going on simultaneously in the sense that if we took a field trip, if we had field trips at uh, Mises U, we could go out and find some mining operations or we could find some transportation services and we could find some uh, retail services all going on at the same time. But of course, uh, they're based on different phases of a production process. The iron ore extraction won't show up uh, as a consumer good until much later. Nonetheless, we can go to Walmart and see the consumer goods that uh, will be produced at that uh, later time. So it has those two definitions so that when we transfer resources, for instance, from a late stage to an early stage, it doesn't mean that we're doing time travel. <laughs> Some of my sophomores get tripped up that way. Uh, okay, so it says watch the resources or goods in process, this is the working capital, move through the stages. Let's see if this will work. Yeah. Okay, move through the stages. Now, this concept was available as early as 1931. I think I note that this is when he introduced his triangle, the same year that Henry Ford was still producing the Model A. It was the last year of the Model A, but that's how old the theory is. And Henry Ford, if you read the history of Henry Ford, uh, he, he really had dabbled in all the stages of production. He owned uh, fields of iron ore, and, and he, he owned the processing, and, and he just did it all, which is kind of neat. I mean, Henry Ford is one of my heroes, at least for some reasons. I, trouble with him in some areas. Uh, but anyhow, I like to use them as an example to show what the stages of production means. We ought to be able to use it to produce some of those Model A's. We'll see if it'll work. There. <laughs> those are Model A Roadsters, okay, 19, 1931. Okay, let's get rid of that. 
Okay, we got the triangle now to work with, the summary depiction of the intertemporal structure. And I use the term secular growth. In an economy that's experiencing secular, secular growth, the triangle increases in size, but not in shape. By secular growth, I mean that, to put it in knighting terms, plowing back into the capital structure is more than just capital maintenance. But that's sort of ongoing. In other words, we're not talking about a change in the rate of savings, or we're not talking about credit expansion. We're just talking about a healthy economy that's growing, and that each year it produces a little more than the year before, because uh, that much of, of the output is plowed back into the capital structure. Uh, and so the thing grows. Watch the structure expand. Okay, so it's expanding, but without changing in shape, right? So in a way, I've already picked up <clears throat> on that aspect of night where he shows an expanding economy. We can do that with the Austrians too, but it's just very much a preliminary thing. And much more important, go back to my original triangle, is what happens when preferences change, okay? So when people choose to save more, the change in their preferred temporal pattern of consumption is registered by the market, first and foremost by a reduction in interest rates. Well, yeah, that's true. Uh, and that's going to change the structure of things, reduced current consumption. See, if they're saving more, it means they're consuming less. And so if they're consuming less, that guy that was stocking inventory is not going to stock as much inventory, right? So he's going to have to cut back. Uh, so that frees up resources in the late stage, and the lower interest rates favor more time-consuming production processes. The interest rates lower now because people are saving more, which makes more funds available and bids down the price of those funds. And that favors long-term production because long-term production has a big component of carrying costs, of interest cost, all right? And so you expect to see that triangle now change shapes, right? This is something that Knight ignores and that Keynes never saw because Keynes treats that initial reduction in late stage activities as something that happens throughout the whole process, throughout the whole structure. So if consumption goes down, then everything goes down. That's the paradox of thrift uh, in Keynes. And so now what do we need to do here? So now it says, watch the structure of production respond to an increase in saving. Well, what do you expect to see? You expect to see that resources migrate towards the higher order goods, okay? Uh, and you might even imagine that maybe some security guard at uh, Walmart or wherever, in, working in retail, becomes a security guard uh, at a mine, mining operation. Okay, so there'll be movement of labor in that direction. Let's watch it. There it goes, okay. The resources move that way. Now we've got six stages of production. And the way I've shown it now, you see consumption is reduced. Well, that's, that's the initial part of the dynamic. That's what we mean by an increase in saving is people reducing consumption. Isn't that right? That's why people save. They save in order to be able to consume more in the future. All right? Uh, and uh, so it's only in the future that they consume more. But now, with a beefed-up capital structure, the economy can grow faster. That's how it works. And we probably can be able to see that. Now, what I'm going to do is pair it up now with my uh, capital stock and uh, show how that works. Um, here's the Hayek in construction. I'll show half of the Hayek in construction and then come back to it after the capital stock. So increased saving results in a reallocation of resources among stages of production. Okay, here are the differential interest rate sensitivities and I, I like that term. I, I've been using that term fairly consistently in my recent work to 
to give the idea of how that uh, reallocation uh, occurs, differential interest rate sensitivities. So interest, long-term capital is much more sensitive to interest rates than short-term capital. Right? And that's where we see that uh, saving, beefing up the capital stock. I might mention here, uh, just to nip in the bud, uh, some misunderstanding about uh, Hayek or about the Austrians. Um, some people see the Austrians, or particularly Hayek, as cheerleaders for growth, okay? That uh, you people really ought to save more. You know, sound like your parents, right? You people really ought to save more. And, and really, that's not what it's about at all. Uh, Hayek would say, save as much or save as little as you prefer. I mean, these are preferences, just like any other preferences for ice cream or whatever. Save as much or save as little as you prefer. But recognize that if you save a lot, the economy will grow. If you save a little, it won't. It might even go the other way. Okay? Just realize what the consequences are. Don't, for instance, save a little and then expect the government to grow the economy. They grow really shouldn't be used as a transitive verb in that sense. Right? It used to be only the Democrats talked about growing the economy. But in the last several le elections, both parties want to grow the economy. They just have different ideas on how they're going to grow it. Okay? Well, they can't grow it, okay? But you can grow it uh, by saving more, right? But it's your choice, right? I'm not, I'm not trying to be your parent, okay? Although you probably should save more. <laughs> okay. So. No, I think I'm going backwards there. Oh, I like to watch that, okay. So here's the night in. Okay, increase in saving, saving beyond technical requirements result in an increase in the capital stock and a decrease in the flow of consumables with no implications about capital's temporal structure. So with Knight, he doesn't even bother about what caused the increase in the, the feedback loop, in the plowback. What caused that? It doesn't matter if it's saving is one thing, if it's credit expansion, same thing, okay? And so sure enough, he can show that, but he just shows the capital stock uh, growing like that with no implications whatsoever about the temporal aspect because he thinks that that's uh, totally irrelevant. Okay? Now go back to Hayek for, for a minute. So the increase in output of consumer goods uh, emerges over time as the early and intermediate stages move through the more time consuming. Uh, production process. But here's what I'm showing is that the economy grows more. In other words, it grows at a higher rate because more is being plowed back. So once again, what we've captured is the change in the rate of growth uh, of the economy. Okay, It's the change in the rate of growth of the economy as a result of your uh, deciding to save more, uh, for instance. Okay, now... Uh, Again, I want, I want this lecture to be seen as a setup for some of the stuff I'm going to do uh, tomorrow. But here I just have a one-liner. says, this construction allows us to depict both economic growth and the boom-bust cycle. So uh, tomorrow when we look at this thing again, we're going to abandon, you might be happy about this, the, the Frank Knight view. We'll bring it back when we deal with Friedman. But we're going to abandon that, that view and recognize that the economy behaves very differently from an increase in saving than it does from an increase in credit expansion. And we'll be able to track the particulars and see just how it works. Okay, thank you very much.